So my name is, uh, I also speak, um, I also speak uh, Norwegian, that I guess none of you speaks Norwegian? No? Okay. You can learn very, you know, we have this app now called, um, what is it? Duolingo. Okay. That you can learn Norwegian. But also I speak some Spanish. So we will try if some word, you know, we don't know the meaning in, in, in English and in Portuguese, we'll try to use uh, Spanish. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So we have, you know, the main the main purpose of production, okay, is we have some fluid in a container, okay, in a place that we call a reservoir. And we want to transport that somehow through a system to another place that we call the processing facilities. And my intention with the today's class is to to give you an overview how that system looks like. By the way, how many here, uh, you know, have had some some internship or some contact with, with the oil industry? So knows how a well a well look like, a separator looks like. None of you. Okay. Okay. So we are we are going to look now this first part of the class. We're going to look now how this system looks like, okay? Here we just have an arrow, but we are going to look what kind of things do we use to produce oil, okay? Because that's important to have in mind when we go to the second part, which is flow equilibrium, nodal analysis. How do we analyze these systems, okay? And here you could think that, that we have a flow, okay? We have a flow of um, oil or we have a flow of, of uh, gas, that flows from the reservoir to the processing facilities. And that's due because this reservoir is under pressure. You can imagine that it's like a tank that is at a high pressure. And you have some other place where you have a separator that is at low pressure. And because you have this pressure difference, that actually what is causing a flow from the reservoir to the separator. So let's look a bit more at the separator to see what we have inside. How the separator makes sure that I keep this constant pressure. The other one, you know more or less, okay? You have a pressure, a reservoir pressure, some fluid there at high pressure. And if we start to extract fluids, actually that pressure is going to change with time. It's going to be a function of time, right? Depending on how much I have taken from that reservoir. But how this pressure stays constant, okay? So let's make a simple sketch of a separator. Okay. So we have one main line where the mixture comes in. Let's say we have initially oil and gas. Okay. And then I separate and I have gas and oil. Okay, we have a level. So any any of you has any suggestions how to keep that pressure constant of that separator? First, we have to know what pressure are we talking about, right? So we go and stick, make a hole on this separator and stick a pressure gauge where we can actually measure pressures of the separator, okay? And if you want to keep, let's say, the, the, pressure, the, the pressure constant, you have to be sure that everything that comes in is exactly equal to the everything that comes out somehow, okay? There has to be mass conservation within this volume. Okay, who here is uh, mechanical engineering? Mechanical engineer? No? Chemical? Petroleum? So, no architecture, I hope? No? Okay. Well, the point is that we like to make a control volume, okay, and say everything that comes in has to be equal to everything that comes out, okay? So for that, we come here and put two main things that we want to control, okay? Two valves that actually we, the hat indicates that we can, is something that is automatically controlled to open and close. And the next thing we make is we put here a floater, 
Okay? And we want to make sure that this pressure is constant at a set point. So we take a measurement that is controlling that valve, and we want to make sure that the level is also constant. So we take that measurement and put it on that valve. So we have a control system, a computer. You can use you know, a, a bachelor student. You can use your little brother. You have someone that is all the time measuring. And if that goes up, it's opening. If that goes down, it closes. Okay? And that's the control system of the separator. Okay? And that's how we keep the pressure constant in the separator. And that's how we can say there is really flow between this PR that really the reservoir pressure is changing very, very slow. So if you go at a certain point in time, you can see, oh, it's producing from a constant pressure at that particular point in time to a const another constant pressure downstream, which is the separator. And that's how the separator is keeping that pressure constant. You have there someone, you have a control system, an automatic control system, that is making sure that taking more than what comes in, okay? And some other interesting things about the separator is that you have, so why you have this level controller? Well, if it goes too low, okay, oil we're going to paint with green, okay, and gas with red, okay, our convention. And if it goes too low, you might have what you call blow by, okay? Gla gas blow by. And why is this an issue? Because gas occupies, like you know, the, the volume that the gas occupies is very big, okay? So if you, gas now, these lines are sized for liquid, which has a very low volume. If now comes a big bulk of gas coming through that line, then the velocities will be much higher and then the pressure drop will be much higher and that will cause to kind of to collapse our system, okay, due to this gas blow by. So that's why I want to keep the level fixed. And what happens if the liquid level starts to come up, then I have liquid carryover. Okay, which also I don't want. We will see later that here you have some equipment that requires only gas to work properly. If you have liquid carryover, then that equipment is going to be impacted somehow. Okay? So that's why usually if we see the separator from the lateral section, we have different, okay, we have like three, several bands, okay? And we have the high, the alarm for high, high level, okay? The alarm for low, high level, the normal level where we're going to set our point, and then we have the alarm for a high, low level, and low, low level. Okay? And there is some tolerance. For example, if the level starts getting here, then you start taking actions, an alarm goes off, but still the, the system is operating. But after it reaches a critical, the LLL, for example, this, this, the system will be stopped. Okay? The plant will be shut down. Okay, so you have different, you used to say that this is not, you set it to a point and that's all, but actually you have different alarm systems, and here you should write high um, high high level, low high level. high, low level, and low, low level. Yes? So far, so good? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> so now let's talk about, after we have set that straight, okay, we have two points, and that's going to be extremely important. These two boundary points in our system, keep them in mind, it's like our anchor, okay? We... Here, that will be fixed, and that will be fixed. And now we're going to try to find out what happens in between, okay? But these two, no matter what I do, unless it's an emergency, these two will be all the time fixed, okay, for a given point in time. If I look at the reservoir, let's say a year from now, that pressure might be different, but the separator pressure should be constant, okay? 
Yes. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about layout of production systems. Yes? Yes, I'm going to, to, but I recommend you to take your notes. You know, there was a, a recent study where people found out that when you write your own notes, you helps you to memorize better, okay? It stays better on your brain. But I will give you this, this, you know, I will send you ask for the email address or send it to Professor Alex so he can send it to all of you distributed after each day, okay? Or maybe next day. Okay, layout of production systems. So we have, a, you know, we have, depending on where the wells, where our field is located, we have two main, very distinct options. We have offshore, okay, and that's what I'm going to talk about now, offshore and onshore, okay, depending on where I have my, my field. And offshore, I have, again, two main divisions, and one of them is Platform wells, okay. or you will see now just in a minute, but also we call it dry Christmas tree. Okay, that basically consists. If we see, you know, our that's the seabed. Okay, and let's say here I have some reservoir. Okay, so then, and here I have my water level, okay, and we put, you know, just to avoid any confusion, we put a fish, so you're sure that's, you know, we are in the water layer, so we actually, we build a platform, and we can have different types, okay, but we, in this case, I make it very simple, and from there, we drill wells, just like if we were onshore. Okay, we are standing here and we drill wells to reach the target. So let's put the wells in this color, maybe. Okay. So what main characteristic do you see in this drawing? In this platform platform wells? That the wells are deviated. Okay, that means I drill from a very limited, maybe it might be like two times this room, okay, this size. But I drill from here, and if I went all the way vertical, I will be drilling in the same place, which doesn't make much sense, okay, to drain a, a relatively small volume with a bunch of pipes. So what I do, I drill initially vertical, and then I start deviating to try to reach different uh, locations. Okay? And... <clears throat> okay, so usually these these wells I dr are drilled. I have to, you know, I have many different things. Okay, but um, I put here on top a drilling tower. Okay, that actually has all the equipment that I need to drill these wells. The problem sometimes is that this length might be relatively big. Okay. And then the drilling package has to be very, very big, and then has to have, like, because really what it dictates, if it has to be big or all the, the power that has to use for the drilling is the horizontal reach, okay? It's the total reach of the world, where it has to go, how far away it has to go. And if this part has to be big, it's more expensive, it's more costly, that's affecting negatively the development of my field, and also it's more weight for my platform, so it makes the whole thing more and more has to be bigger and more and more expensive. Okay, so sometimes what I make is that the so that's called the drilling package in a platform. Okay, so sometimes platforms I can also make them without the drilling package. You know, here I have an advantage, and you have to run to catch up. I can come with another rig, 
okay? It's called a jackup. That the rig basically it's some legs, and then you have, you know, you have some gears that it can anchor those legs. First, it deploys them down, and then it starts building up, jacking itself up on top of these legs. Okay, that's called a jacket, drilling jacket. Okay, and after it reaches certain height. Then it takes away, it's made out of different parts, but it has here this drilling tower. Okay. And then it moves it with also a mechanism to the right. Okay. To drill and to, to make intervention to drill the wells. Okay. That is if my platform doesn't have the drilling package. Okay. So these are the two main differences. You see a platform, and if you see a very big tower, that means that the platform has a drilling package. That means for some reason they manage is cheap enough so it doesn't affect negatively the cost of the project. And also maybe they have to, why, why do you need to have also the drilling package during the life of the field? Maybe you want to take out the tubing. Maybe you want to perform intervention on the well. Maybe you want to modify something inside the well. Okay, so that's why maybe sometimes it has a built-in drilling package, and sometimes it doesn't have, so you just used, for example, a drilling jack. Okay, that clear? <clears throat> okay, so we prefer, really, this option gives you, you know, it's a, I have, it's like much easier, we, let's call it, you know, you have, much easier access to the to the to the well, easy access to the well for intervention. It's also limited. If my reservoir, for example, is very spread, okay, then I probably cannot use cannot drill all wells from the same location, okay, because then this one will be extremely big. And then I will need it will be very costly. Okay. So that's a dry. Other options that I have for, for a similar types of, of system that is not using platform, it's uh, for example, so that's uh, let's call it here platform without drilling package. Other options are, for example, um, I think I have, let me just, just put, I like to put, you know, the, the images, they are not necessary, but I, I like to put some just so you see how it looks like, uh, besides my ugly handwriting. Okay, so here you have a platform. Okay, so that platform, does it have or not a drilling package? Okay, it doesn't have, it looks like it doesn't have a drilling package. So in this case, you need something else to go and drill the wells. Okay, but that's how the thing looks like. Nice. Um, Okay, and then we have, also we could have some other arrangements. We are not going to go into that too much, but you can have also some other types of, of, um, of uh, we call it offshore structures, that they are, not, they are not supported vertically, okay? They are uh, floating, but one of them is called a spar. That is a floating structure, it's like a big pipe. I guess you have seen some pictures, a spar. And has on top of it, you know, everything, all facilities, etc. Maybe it has here the drilling. And wells are actually drilled through it to the reservoir. Okay. In this case, even if it is floating, 
this bar is relatively very, very, very long. So that means that the variation here, if there is the wave variation is big, it will remain, it will, it will be relatively stable. It will, um, it will allow, you know, it will allow that the spar keeps relatively stable and don't have too much vertical movement. Okay. Also, another structure that is similar to spar is also used is called a TLT. Tension platform, tension leg platform, sorry. Okay. Where you anchor, you know, is these structures that have a leg and they have a bottom here and then have another leg, a deck, and maybe they have here the drilling tower, if they have, okay? And then they have some support, they have some wires, okay? These are like some very thick wires or, or okay, that they keep them in tension. They actually, they are, they are in tension and they're pulling the platform down, okay, by flotation. If you don't pull it, it will float completely up. And that limits also very much the movement of the platform, of the, of the TLP, allowing to have dry welds. Okay, many advantages of having dry welds. But as you see, you know, it causes a problem. I need all of the space of the wells. I need to have, you know, to house all the wells. For example, if I then discover someplace here that I want to drain, maybe I don't have more slots available. Okay, that's one disadvantage. If I want to drill, it depends if I have space to put that well in the middle. Maybe I, I won't have. Okay, that's one of the disadvantages of. Um, so let me write that here. Um, okay. I have limited well for what I call in-field drilling. After I have designed my field, I'm starting to produce, I then I discovered that there was some area that I really didn't manage to, to, to empty. So then I drill another well to try to improve the recovery factor of the, of the field. Okay, TLP, SPAR, some names just, you know, um, and these are limited. These they like very much in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, these are very common in the Gulf of Mexico, where many American companies are working. And uh, I think I had it here. I think the, the maximum depth is around 1,500 meters water depth for these structures, or maybe 1,700. But it's around that number. So if you go too deep, what is the, you know, all of these developments offshore in Mozambique, what is the average depth that you that you have? Do you know? It's uh, what I read is for fourteen hundred, something like that, one thousand four hundred meters for coral, for um, espadarte, no? Well, you know, we leave it as homework. But uh, so you have that option and these platforms that it's, uh, they're fixed, usually limited to a 400 meter water depth, okay? So you have an idea what kind of systems these guys are going to use, okay? This, uh, when they start developing these offshore fields in, in Mozambique. Yes, that's all I wanted to say for for a platform. And now we go to subsea. Or what we call wet Christmas tree. Okay. And wet basically because I, I don't have access. Like in this case, I have a person that can actually go and change the, the settings of the well, okay? Can actually 
touch the, the wheelhead the, the wheelhead. In this case, the, the trees are completely subsea, so you have to find another way to op to operate them. Okay? And that's the, again, for example, that case that I was telling you about, you have okay, you have a platform. Again, you have your reservoir, but then you have, for example, very close by, you have a small reservoir or another small development. So in that case, it's too far away to reach it from the platform or you don't have enough slots on the plat platform to do it. So you just come and drill one subsea well and then you tie in the production to that platform. Okay? So you can do it like that, that is producing to an existing subsea wells producing to existing facilities. Okay. Or you can have also standalone uh, subsea wells that are completely, because when you go to water depth more than 1,700 meters, then you have to use only subsea wells. Okay. And it might be you know, the, so let's say complete subsea systems. Okay. Where you have okay, what you call an FPSO, okay, a big boat where I have all my facilities and then I have my subsea wells. I collect and then I transport it to the ship. Okay? And I have all my processing facilities there on top of this ship. Okay? <clears throat> and in the same manner has, you know, has platform wells, I can drill you know, subsea systems, so let's, uh, where I have here, I can have two types. I can have a template drilled wells. Okay. That means I make a common structure because to, to have, you know, you will see now how it looks like, but it's it's a big structure that you have, you ha you have to protect from for example, the fishermen that won't, won't be damaged, it has to protect against environment, has to protect against corrosion, has a lot of equipment that has to carry by itself. So it's a very big, robust structure, what I have to put here. Okay. So to save to save some time, to save cost, what you make is you make a structure on the seabed okay. that has actually four slots. Okay. Or it can have more. Sometimes it can have 12, 8, etc. And then from there, I drill. That's a seabed. Okay. Let me put it here. Okay. And from there, you drill wells. And of course, they have to be, you know, deviated. The same, the same logic that for the platform wells. You have to drill first vertical and then starting to deviate. Okay. So that's what I call template. And then another approach is satellite wells. A satellite wells is like in, you know, if I have a, an area that I want to reach here and then I have another one I want to reach here. So they are really, each well is like its own unit. Okay. Uh, what is the advantage of that? The well can be much shorter. Okay. If you were going to drill from this place to that location, okay. See the length of the well. It has to be very inclined, very deviated. But when I drill it from this location, exactly vertical on top of it, it can be much shorter. Okay. But then I have to add the cost of a flow line to transport from here to there. Okay. Okay. So that's an FPSO. What FPSO stands for? is floating production
storage and offloading. Okay. It has all of these uh, all of these characteristics. <coughs> And typically, uh, subsea whales. If you know, if you are talking about systems that are completely subsea, you have no more element, you have no platform, etc. They usually produce either to an FPSO, or they can produce also to a semi sub. Okay, a semi sub is very similar to. To a TLP without these cables pulling it down. Okay, it's just floating by itself. But it's similar to this structure that I showed here. Okay, very similar but without the cables. Without the And let's see a bit how, if we have a complete subsea system, how that looks like, more or less. So we said, now let's, we are talking about a top view. So you can have these systems of, okay, four, and you can have another template of four, And there is a pipe that collects the production and passes through it, a flow line, and then at the end goes to the FPSO, okay, to the separator. Okay. <clears throat> we will see in a bit, but, you know, I just... Not to say too much, but we will see you don't only have usually one line, but you have two lines. But they have exactly the same function. The two of them go up, okay? But you use only one. And we will see why is that just, you know, in a, like half an hour. Just give me, give me some time to reach there. So that's if we have a template system, okay, of a template using template wells. And if you have satellite wells, Okay, that's what we call a well slot. Okay. And if you have satellite wells, you have the wells are located, each one of them with its own unit, and we will see how it looks like pretty soon. And you have a central collecting manifold. All of them are connected to that unit. Okay. And from here you have this pipe okay, going to the FPSO. Okay, so let's see how it looks like. Some, you know, uh, okay, that's how a subsea template looks like. And let's uh, take away, so I can use sleeping tool. Okay, where do we talk about template? Okay, that's here, template. Let's make uh, some space. So you anchor it on the on the seabed. These are the piles that are going to be, you know, keeping the weight of the of the structure. And here you have all the covers that get where you have actually the wells. Okay, the well slots. Okay. Uh, you are going to talk about that in a minute. So here you have some configurations. What I was explaining before. Satellite or cluster. 
member cluster. Uh, sorry, the template, okay? Satellite or template. The template will drill the wells from the same structure and satellite will drill them outside and then we merge them. You have to have some commingling unit that is going to commingle all the production from all wells. Okay. And if you have those systems, then we have Okay. This usually this piece of pipe here, we call it a jumper. Okay. And it looks like that. You can see for example that's a, that's a, a, a what we call a Christmas tree. And it's joined to that manifold is is going downstream to the to the system through this jump. Okay, that is joining a, a, a Christmas tree with a, with a manifold. Okay, that more or less clear? Yeah? What? Christmas tree Okay, I'm going to go just starting down. I just want to the key information to take from this all of this explanation is we have two main systems, okay? Platform wells and subsea wells, okay? Platform usually we drill from the same location and deviate and they start to deviate, okay? But all of them meet in the surface. If I have access, okay, I need to change something, the tubing, I need to change a pump that is inside, I need to change a valve, I have a very easy access, okay? I just do it from the platform. When I talk about subsea wells, it's more limited. How do I drill these wells? Okay, with a drilling ship or a semi-sub. Okay, I come with a floating boat that has a rig on top and I start and drilling from, from this floating. And there is a very complicated system because you're drilling, that's all the time in the same place and the boat may be moving up and down. So you have a very complicated compensating system to be able to achieve that. Okay. And the second, second thing I wanted to tell you is that there are two subsea ways ways in subsea system to arrange wells. One of them is using this template. It's a structure where I can drill different wells, okay? That's very similar to like in the platform, I drill it from, from one unique place. Or I have another arrangement, which is satellite, okay? In which I have all wells that are spread. And then I join them and merge them and they go to, to a kind of a collecting structure and then they go to the main transportation. Yeah, that's the, what I wanted to convey here. Okay, and now we go, you know, before we start talking about the Christmas tree, what you were asking, so now let's go to onshore system, how onshore systems look like. Look like. Okay, and onshore systems, usually we have the same arrangement, but we have something that is called standalone wells. Okay. Where each well has, and that's very typical onshore US, and I'm not sure what you have here in, um, in Mozambique, but you have that each well has its own separator very small separator, that's very typical for gas wells, okay? And then the gas is collected someplace and distributed further to the system, okay? In that case, each well behaves like a completely separate unit, okay? Each well is complete, uh, operates completely independent. And then we have another arrangement called network, okay? Where actually wells are interconnected. Okay, and I might have some here. Okay, and I have a network, that's what I call a network of pipes, a network structure. Okay, that is, the, ma the main function is to commingle, okay, to merge, to join production, to collect the production.
and take it to the processing facilities. Okay? Yes? So far, so good? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about, you know, let's... Now that you have that short overview, okay, that I wanted to be very clear because we're going to be, you know, depending on the architecture, you have to, you know, you have to really first define the architecture of the system before you start doing your analysis, okay, that we're going to talk about later. Um, yes, so now let's see the, the components well uh, architecture, okay? Okay. And we have in a well, if we see the, the cross-section of a well, okay. first we have a casing, okay. a relatively big diameter, usually it's 9 and 5 8 inch. Okay. You already took uh, the drilling module, so you already know all the size, how do we define these sizes, I guess. Okay, and then that reaches is either perforated. There are different ways to, to have access to the reservoir. Okay, then inside of it, they have what do I have inside? A production tubing. Okay, that depends on the size. Okay, depends on the reservoir. And so, of course, I have to have some kind of seal here to avoid that the fluid will go all the way to the surface. Okay, so I have packers and I have the, that we are not going to discuss here now. But then here at the top, and that's what I want, you have the following arrangement. That's what we call the Christmas tree of the well. Of the well. So we have, move it a bit down. So we have the lower master valve, okay, did you discuss this with uh, Paul? Yeah? No? Not really? Okay, lower master valve, then you have upper master valve, okay, then we have Actually, two valves that are located laterally that are called wing valve. Okay, wing valve, these two. At the top, if I want to do any intervention on the well, okay, for example, I want to make, to, to make a pressure measurement uh, inside the well, I want to clean inside the tubing, I want to do an operation, I have what is called the swap valve. And then I have the production choke. And here I have to move again. Sorry. For you, it's going to take more time. Okay, and finally I have the pipe okay, that takes the production of the well for. But that's what I call, all of this arrangement that I have on the top is what I call the Christmas tree. Okay. okay. So it's just a collection and array of valves that I have to, to um, you know, to control, to control the, to have access to the well and to have, uh, to control the production of the well. Yes. Okay, so now let's define some critical points that you have to remember for later of the system. This system we call uh, the bottom hole. Okay. This, this point here we call the wellhead. Let me put it in red so it will be... Okay. 
okay? Well head and bottom hole. These are the two points when we talk about a nodal analysis, these are going to be the two points, the main important points that we are going to be talking about. And of course, some place here you have reservoir pressure. Okay, but that, you know, I have to, you have to be able, if I wake you in the middle of the night, maybe call your, your, you know, your family, and I say, you know, sketch it. You have to be able to sketch it, okay, by, by heart. Okay, so you have to make, uh, pra practice many, many times. Okay, and we're going to look a bit more how, how they look like just in a minute. But now let's talk about something very important that is a production manifold. And the production manifold has some very distinct functions. Okay, why, why do we need a production manifold? How do we define a production manifold? A manifold first allows me to commingle the production of several wells. Okay, that's the first function of the manifold. So if you think about it, if I have, you know, all of these wells, it's just, you know, all of them reach to a point where I have a, a you know, a pipe. Okay, all of them reach to this, and that's what we call the manifold, right? There is a second function, so that's commingling the production of all wells. Then the second function of the manifold is to be able to test the well. Okay, what does it mean to test the well? It means to see, to, com to, to measure the rate, okay? How much it is producing, how much of oil, how much of gas, and what is the pressure? Can this pressure that we measure, which, which pressure are we measuring here? Are we reporting when we do a well test? Okay, usually, we put here, we stick here a gauge, okay? And that valve has to be open. So that I measure that pressure, the wellhead pressure, okay? When I perform a well test. And why is it important to perform a test of the well? Okay, let's say that you have here one well that belongs to any, one well here that belongs to an Adarco, one well here that belongs to Sasol, okay? And they mix, and here you have at the end 100,000 barrels. How do you split the cake? What goes to which company? Okay, so for that you need tests. So that's called, one is allocation. That's to split production uh, to different, and it can be that you have different partners in the field, different owners of the well. So it's just to, to allocate, to determine where the production is coming from. Okay? 30%, 20%, 50%, etc. Okay, so that's one purpose of well test. What is the other purpose? Why I perform well test? Something, you know, what uh, Professor Ali told you, you know, I'm not sure when, last week. What do, what do we like from the well? What do we need from the well? What characterizes the well? This IPR, right? This famous inflow performance relationship. Okay. So it also is, is a way to determine the productivity of the well. Okay. And that's something extremely important that allows you to see you know, how the performance of the well. What other approach, you know, what other uh, application? Okay, so it's used for reservoir modeling. To perform history match, okay? With reservoir models, we, we create, we think, you know, we have so much oil and it's distributed in this way and it has this pressure. And I start producing it. 
But then at the end, after five years, I realized, you know, this reservoir is producing much more than what I think. So I have to go and modify my model because it was not as I imagined originally. It is different. So that process is called history matching. Okay, it's basically some uncertain parameters in this model. You know, and a reservoir can be very, very heterogeneous, can have very, very, a lot of variations in, you know, of properties in the reservoir. So I assume first run for a certain time and then see how it behaves compared to what actually, how it actually performs. And I try to make these two the same by changing some parameters in the reservoir. Okay, so that's what I call re history matching. Okay, but the most important and what pays really the money for it is, okay, the money, okay? To see, to split the cake. How much is for it? You take, okay, all the rest is, we are technical people, we like to know how the well will produce, to know the reservoir, etc. but really what defines it is I have to test the wells to define to split the cake. Okay, so I ask you how I make it in this system. How do I, if I say, you know, let's put our separator here. Okay, now that you know what is the purpose of the manifold. So how do I do that here if I have that system? Okay, we are departing from this very simple system. Okay, the meter usually is located here someplace okay and these are meters that are single phase and are orifice met meters sometimes the government says the only way that you can measure the rate of oil and rate of gas is using this orifice meter there is no other accepted method okay so i, I measure them after i have separated the phases so what, what can you think, okay, I have now to see how much well one is producing. How do you find out that? Yeah, but you have to say, okay, I have one million dollars per day. Are they going to trust you that say, no, this has the highest, so you should get 80%. You think that they're going to accept to give an Adarco $800,000 just because you say? Okay. So that's why we have in place, what we make is we make a parallel header. Okay. And then we take another line to something that is, this is the main production separator. Okay. And here I have a smaller separator that I call the test separator. Okay? And periodically that defines by the contract, that defines by the type of the of the arrangement they have. I have to test one by one. Okay, so how do I do that in this system? How do I test, for example, well one I test, well two I test, well three I test. How do I send this well two to the test? Hmm? Very simple, I just take here and put a split, right? And then I send, each well has the option to go to this other header, okay? To go to this, okay? That's what I call the production header. You know, this is the pipeline. So up to here is the production header. And that's the test header. But I'm missing something, okay? What I'm missing in my drawing to make this thing work. Okay, now I find, now well one is connected to both. Well two is also connected to both. But I have something to control. I need something to control when to send well one to test and when to sell well, well two to test, etc. What do I need? Ah, a valve, okay? Where should I put the valve? We put one here and one here. One here and one here. One here and one here. Right? Yes? So if I want to send one to the test only, what do I do? This one should be open. This one? This one? This one? This one? This one? Okay, good. 
Okay, very simple. So now, just to test, you know, that you have understood, we are going to make a small class exercise. But now we are going to have, so the exercise is, I have, again, three wells, but now I have four, uh, sorry, three. I have the test, separator A, and separator B. Okay. Usually, if the production is too big, I cannot take all of it through one separator, but I have to have two. And this is what I call two trains, separator trains. Okay, because for some reason, you know, the separator has a limited size and I cannot make it much bigger and I have a lot of production. So I put two parallel trains that are identical to each other. Okay. <laughs> so let's, you know, now you have pen and paper. So let's make a pause on the recording and try to make solve that problem. We have three wheels and we want to send it to three places. Train separator A, separator B or test separator, how the arrangement of valves looks like, okay? How the manifold looks like, where do you have the test header and the production header? Did you, did you get something similar? No? <laughs> well, you have to, then you have to catch up. So we have, we have the three separators, right? Okay, we have the three lines. Each, each one has to have its own line, okay? Because if you send the production of one well through that line, you don't want any other well to be there, okay? Or go to another separator. So they have to have their own separate line, okay? And you have two wells, for example. Okay. So first I do, I send a line from well one to header A. Okay. A line well one to header B, and a line to test header. Okay. And then I put the box. No? Yes. So what happens in this arrangement if I want to produce well one to A? Okay. This valve has to be. Open. 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 Yes. This one. Close. And this one. Close. Okay. Well, one. I want to produce only to <coughs> A. Closed. Okay. And well, two. Let's say I want to produce to test. This one. Close. This one. Close. This one. Close. Open. Okay. Yes? yes. For the homework, you're going to have seven. No. Yeah, you're going to have something different, okay? You see now, you can repeat it, yeah? You cannot produce wine when you are testing. You cannot put? Produce wine when you are testing. Yes, you can produce when you're testing. Actually, that's what normally, in this drawing here, normally you're producing to A, okay? So normally, all of these are closed. All of these valves are closed. If you want to put one well to the test, you open here and you close here. But all the rest keeps producing. Okay? So that's how you find out how much each well is producing. Okay? We're going to you're going to get an exercise, you know, that will be part of your grade, so related to, to that. Okay? Now let's look, you know, that's uh, the manifold, and let's show you up, uh, you know, how it looks like in real life. Okay. That's an onshore, I think that's a field in Libya. Okay. I ask you, if these are the wells, okay, these are all the wells, they are located some other place, but these are the lines that come from the well, okay, downstream the choke. Yes? So these come to two lines. Which one is the test line and which one is the production line? The small one, okay, because that one has to carry only the rate of the well. Very easy to pick up. Okay, this system has a test line, a test head, okay? So now you see, and this manifold is on top. So if I want to produce 
let's say this is well one to the test. I close this valve and open this valve. Yeah? Very clear. Yes? Okay. If I were going to produce two, if I had two separator trains, A and B, how do I put it in this figure? Another pipe parallel here, right? And then I have to extend this and have another valve there. Yes? Okay. Okay, this is another system. Again, I'm going to ask you the same question. The wells are coming from the right. Okay. Which one is the test? Which one is the, the production Ma uh, manifold? That one is production. This one is test. I want to produce two test. Open here, close here. The opposite, close here, open here. Yes? <laughs> Clear, crystal clear. Okay. Okay, now let's go to this, you know, the arrangement that I told you before, template subsea wells arranged in template. Okay. Remember the template is this box type structure where I have four slots and I drill from there all wells okay and I told you that I had two lines okay that were coming in that were coming in and out of this uh, you know that were connected to this template so now you think you start to think why I have these two lines what is the answer why do I have these two lines based on what we saw before <laughs> to test the well okay to know how much the well is producing is exactly the same thing I have to put two lines and then you know to be able to measure and if I look inside the box okay now I'm going to make a zoom I'm going to say well one well two well three and well four okay and I have two headers one here and one here okay. let's say that these pipes they are closed at the end okay now I ask you, how do I connect? I make sure what is the arrangement that I have to make to produce, you know, one to one or one to two or two to one, two to two, etc. How does it look like? Okay. Again, I have to put a valve here, and then I have to put another valve here. Okay, that's for wheel one, and then I do the same for wheel two, three, and four. Right? So I have exactly the same arrangement, but this is subsea. Okay? The other one you see is onshore, so I have really good access, but the other I have to squeeze that all of that in that small square, okay, in that small tent. Yes? So here I have one for that line, and then one for this line, and so forth. One for this line, one. Okay? Yes, and I'm going to show you how it looks like. We are, you know, we are closing to the break, so let's uh, take a few more minutes and then we take a break. It's uh, 15 minutes, is it? Okay. We are waiting for the break. Uh... Okay. I show you this here. And tell me, these are one five going to a separator, another pipe is not shown here, going to the other separator, okay, it's behind here, okay. The well comes from here, the well is not shown in the picture, the well comes from here, okay, let's follow the line, goes, we have this fan shape, I'm not going to tell you yet what, but it then it goes to two valves, okay, routing valves, these valves are going to say one of them sends it to this pipe, is connected to this pipe, and one of them is connected to the pipe on the other side. Okay. Exactly the same arrangement, a bit more complicated. Again, for the other world that comes here, I have reached a point two valves, one to produce here, and one to produce to the other world. Okay. If I want to test the well. Any questions so far?
No? A lot of questions, maybe? <laughs> okay, so let's take a break, 15 minutes break. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so going back, you know, just refreshing a bit what... So in that case, how the manifold, you know, looks like. If I have two tests and production header, okay, you can see very easily that the, this is just uh, two headers, okay, and I put the, the wells, one valve to produce to one and one to produce to the other, okay? No big issue there. This system, also the same, you know, that's only didn't have the drilling package. This system's also the same. So usually when we have dry Christmas trees, okay, Christmas trees that I have access, the, the issue, the connection with the manifold and the test separator is not, is not very, you know, not, it's not a big issue. Okay, I can do it very easily. That's why I have access to the wells. I can test them very, very easily. I forgot here to mention that this is intention, okay? So this makes a force, a vertical force pulling it down and then the buoyancy, okay, because it has some, it can float, has a force going up and these two cancel each other, okay? The buoyancy and then the this from the cable, okay? From this tensioning cable. If for some reason, for example, comes this wave, okay? And push it to the side, what is going to happen is that how is going to be the new configuration? If we may assume that it's a box, okay? It's going to be like that, right? And then the force component is not only, is you know, it's going along the cable. So you have two, actually two components, one going, pulling it to the, to the side and one pulling it down. So this component pulling it to the side, it actually is going to bring the TLP back exactly above where it has this, the anchoring point, okay? So that's also something something uh, that I forgot to mention. The tensioning cable limits the vertical movement, okay, such that the well, you know, the Christmas tree can be uh, dry, and also every time is pulled out of, you know, uh, out of um, we will say alignment, it will be pulled back just by the same force of the cable. Yeah, and these two are the only ones that have really slow movement. Uh, Low enough, and low enough here we say three meters, okay, which is quite, you know, up and down, okay, three meters up and down, that really they can have dry weddings. Okay. Then we came to subsea systems, and there the issue becomes a bit more complex, okay, we, we still want to have the two lines, we, you know, for, for that system, we have to put also a manifold inside. Okay, a, a manifold that allows me to produce to two lines, the test line and the and the production line. Okay, and they are different. Okay, here is the difference. Okay, so here that's what you see. If I have here a manifold, okay, and four wells producing. How are these wells? These are. Is this a template or is this a satellite? Satellite. Okay. You have one line for each to this manifold, and then in this manifold we have an arrangement that allows to route the production from well four either to this line or to that line. Yes? That here? Yeah? Okay. In this case, they went for the brute force approach. I have to measure each well. Okay, so each well will have its own line. Okay. What is the difference between this and that one? If let's say this is 2,000 meters depth and um, I don't know eight kilometers away, each one of these lines probably will be very very expensive. Okay, here you have to make only two. Here you have to make one for each one of the wells. So usually this is not so economic. Okay, it also has the same function. I have one line for each well, and then here I have the manifold on the top. Okay. But it's more more. <coughs> here is another arrangement where I actually have. Okay, here comes a tricky question. Here, can I test how much each well is producing in this arrangement? No, okay. So there is another purpose why we have two lines, but we are going to talk about it just in a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Mm 
Yes. So we assess the, the budgets in terms of costs, not in terms of the system. Which one? Of the onshore? Or yes. these two? Yes, these two. If we need to assess it. Well, it's not really advantage, but if, uh, for example, this this system might be, okay, because you have you have the boat, okay, and you have one target, one well that is far away, and the other one that is far away. So each one of them will have their own line because they are completely opposite one to the other. Okay, might be just some physical. You are this one is developing this reservoir and this one is producing from this reservoir okay but when i you know when i have the option to have the minimum number of lines i go for it okay. i i to have multiple lines that that causes that the project will be extremely costly okay remember this sketch you have to be able to draw it i wake you in the middle of the night 1 a.m you have to be able to go and sketch okay and put every every element okay downhole or bottom hole wellhead lower master valve upper master valve wing valves swap valve and the choke okay let's make here you know a small comment a side comment so the upper master valve and lower master valve these are on off valves okay that means they are either open or they are closed there is no in between okay if i flow in between what happens with the valve erosion and then it doesn't doesn't close anymore okay so i damage the seal surface of the valve if i keep it you know in, in a mid position okay these valves usually look like make let's see if i have space In the open position, these valves provide what is called, okay, that's the valve, and here I have an actuator, okay, I, I put it very simple, just some stem attached to the, to, the, to the valve, okay, to the closing part, which is, this is solid, this is solid, okay, and that's the moving part. This is the moving part, and this is the, the stationary part. Okay. So if it, you know, it has full bore, it's like a full bore valve. This this valve. This I'm talking about this. Okay. This um, the upper master, the lower master, also the wing, and the the wing master, uh, the wing valve are also on off. And the swap valve, okay, are also on off. Okay. We should make it a bit deeper. So if I if I for any reason okay, make a mistake and I leave it halfway, okay, then the fluid will start flowing something like this, right? And the bad thing is that you will have first you will have a big erosion 
here, but also you will be damaging this area will be exposed. And that's the area where I actually have the seal, okay? When this one goes all the way up, okay, let's again try to pull it all the way up. Something that you can make, but I can make, okay? Now it's in the complete closed position. So is the pressure, when there is here, let's say that's from the well, okay, from the reservoir, and that's from the separator. This pressure is much higher than this pressure. So actually it pushes the, the moving part against this, this uh, and creates a seal, okay? Yeah. So if I leave it, these valves are not made to leave it, you know, half open. They are either completely open or completely closed. Okay, and they have full bore opening. That means when I align it, I should be able to flow. If this is two inch, I should be able to flow with a two inch uh, bowl, for example, with no restriction. Okay, should be able to flow through the valve. <clears throat> okay, we are, we are here missing a very critical element that um, you know that that I forgot and I, I hope you know you can help me to find out what it is so let's say I have all wells okay now forget about this arrangement I have all wells producing to separator A okay that means this valve is open this one is open and this one is open but let's say well one and two are producing for a very strong reservoir with very high reservoir pressure but well three is producing for a, a very small reservoir with relatively low pressure Okay. What might happen if I put all the three producing to the same line? What do you feel if, if three is, is very, very weak? Okay, it's a well very, very weak. You can get actually backflow. Okay, the wells start producing not only to the separator, but also start producing, and you have a thief well. Okay, that is starting to thief, uh, to steal part of the production. So to avoid that, what do we have to put? Those of you mechanical engineers, a non-return valve, okay, also called a check valve. So we are going to put here, and the universal indication for check valve is this one, okay? So we have to have it where the check valve goes in this drawing, after the choke, okay? That's a check. Okay. Um, yes. This this uh, was clear. What we had in the center. Okay. So if you go back to this drawing, to this uh, you know photo figure, etc. You see, there is something in between, okay? You have all the well slots, and you have something in between, and that's where I have all of these two headers, okay? I have this manifold, this arrangement of valves to be able to send well to one line or send to the other line, okay? Okay, just to finish up with, um, we know, with the things that we have. Uh, to the things, to the valves that we have on the well, okay? To the components, or let's say valves. Okay, we have two two main ones that we haven't discussed yet. We have the DSV uh, called downhole safety valve. Okay. Remember, I have to be able to draw it, you know, in the middle of the night. If you wake me up, it also applies for me. I have to go be able to draw very quickly, a well, my casing, Information. Okay. 
Okay. I have another valve located here. And that's what they call the downhole safety valve. DSV, or also called uh, has SSSV, subsurface safety valve. Okay. And uh, and the main the main purpose of that is let's say you know it, it has to do with the safety strategy of the well uh, between the reservoir and the surface we all the time have to have two barriers okay it's part of the safety strategy so and these two barriers not only because you might say okay here I have one valve and here I have two so I have two valves but these valves they have to be such or these barriers, they have to be such that if an event happens, okay, if something happens that affects one of the barriers, doesn't affect the other barrier, okay? Let's say you have, you know, like in these platform wells, okay, let me see if I have a picture, how it looks like. I think I had one. Well, they should be one here. Okay, like in this figure, where you have all the wells drilled from the same place, you have, a, like I told you, a room maybe twice this big, where you have all wells, okay? And you are producing from one well, and then you're doing drilling in some other well. What happens if, for some reason, the BOP, when they are installing it on the well, they knock one of the Christmas tree, okay? The, when that event happens, actually, doesn't matter if you have two valves here, it will knock the whole, the whole tree, Okay, and then you will have, you have no barrier. Okay, you're unprotected. So that's why the requirements, okay, let's write here something very quickly about safety um, barrier philosophy. Philosophy, how do you write philosophy like that? Okay, you must have always two barriers between reservoir and you know and the and the environment okay reservoir and and the, and the other thing is that these barriers if an event affects one of these barriers it shouldn't affect the other so they have to be that means that they have to be physically in two separate places okay barriers must be And the third one is that they have to be, you know, the 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 actioning or the the, the action mechanism must be independent. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how this DSV looks like. So that's in part part of the strategy. This usually is located maybe something between. 100 meters, okay, to 200 meters below the seabed, and that's just there just for safety, okay, in case something happens to the main barrier. Remember, all of these valves, the main, why do you have two? Well, you have two to, to you, you know, just to protect the, the, if you close the well, you're sure that you are, you know, you are containing the pressure, you're containing the flow of the rest, the, the fluids in the reservoir. Okay, so I'm going to show you now very quickly how that looks like. I think that's uh, interesting. So here you see you have that's coming from the reservoir, and that's here you have the on the way to the wellhead, and you have one is like one uh, yeah. let me just show you the I will show you the video okay
as a real one we have in our lab there. So you see that comes from the reservoir going up. So now I'm going to push this annular or this, uh, this pipe is actually pushing this flapper against the wall, okay? Because it's in the lower position. Yes? And to be able to do it, you have to have always, you know, this has to be energized. You have to be hydraulic, have to have hydraulic pressure from the top, okay, all the time pushing that, this pipe down, okay, such that it will cover the flapper, okay? Otherwise, there is a very strong spring here that will push it up, okay? When you push it up, that pipe goes up and then the flapper is exposed and closes. You will see that very, you know, it happens very quickly, so you have to be alert. Okay, now it's in the closed position. You see this big spring is making pressure. Now I release. You saw how it, it went up. Okay, so that's what happens. And that's actually, you always in the well have to have this energized. So you always have to be injecting continuously or keeping the pressure constant, okay, at a constant value to be able to be sure that that remains open. Okay, when that fails, that closes, and then I, I'm sure that I protect the reservoir. There is no contact between the reservoir and the surface. Um, subsurface safety valve. Uh, Yep, so here I have a picture what, you know, part of the, what triggered that, you know, not so, not so long ago was the, the Gulf War when they were bombing these wells in, in Kuwait, in Kuwait, and uh, actually they had no downhole, downhole safety valve, okay, so they were burning because they took out the main envelope, the main barrier, so they were burning for a long time and was very difficult to control. Okay. So that's one small thing that we have. We are not going to talk too much for us, you know, the main valves are in the Christmas tree, but just for, I think, curiosity, is interesting. And then we go to the main element that we can control and the one that we use to control production. That is, which one are we missing? The choke, okay? And that we're going to talk a lot about the choke, choke, or what we call production choke. And production choke, we have basically two types. We have um, a fixed opening and variable opening. Okay. Fixed opening is just, you know, if I make, um, actually it looks something like that. That's the main pipe from the from the wellhead. Okay, that we call from wellhead. Okay, and that goes to separator. Okay, and I put here a restriction, something that is just a bare a pipe with a very thick wall. I have just a, a recess to keep it in place. Okay. And here I have an access point where I can go. I open it and I take and I change. Okay, so that's what we call a beam choke. Okay, and the problem, as you see, I just put it there. It has certain pressure drop. And what happens with time, as I told you? The pressure of the reservoir goes down. So when the pressure goes down, I have to put as a, a bigger choke, okay, a choke that has a bigger area. Initially, I might be using something like that, okay, very small opening, because I have a lot of energy. If I don't control it, I will produce a very, very high rate, okay? And with time, I use a choke with a bigger and bigger and bigger opening. And actually, we are going to, you know, we, we are going to do some modeling of some calculation of this choke. And then we have variable opening that I'm going to sketch it, you know, I'm going to sketch it here, but uh, basically
looks something like that. Okay, that I can regulate that from wellhead. And that's to separator. Okay, and I can regulate by moving the stem up and down. I can regulate the opening and I can regulate the pressure point. Okay, so typically for onshore systems, remember offshore systems, uh, onshore, the access of the wellhead is a problem. So onshore systems, we typically have, and that's what you will probably find, the you know the fields here onshore that you have a beam choke, and if you have uh, uh, offshore systems, probably you use uh, an adjustable, okay, variable open. That's also called adjustable choke. And this is called a needle, needle choke. Okay. For all kinds of reasons, needle chokes are no, not so used anymore. So they use a more complicated type of choke, which is uh, called a cage choke. Where we have basically a cylinder. Okay, the cylinder I can move it up and down again with the same mechanism. The, the choke has some openings. Okay. And it's like, uh, I will show you now a figure, but it's like um, a pipe that has some holes. So when it's on the upper, you know, it's when it's on the, on the highest position, then you have a lot of holes exposed to the flow. So the flow comes here and enters through the holes and goes and continues down. Okay, when I have, when I want to restrict the flow, I pull it down, okay, and then I have less holes exposed, and then the pressure drop is higher. More or less, you, you got the idea from the bad drawing? Okay, so let me show you now a, a good, a better picture, okay. It's a cage and they are typically used for subsea systems and also for a platform. Okay, you see you have the holes and there initially you have all of them are exposed. And when you bring it down, then you are just, you know, they are partially, not, not all of them are, are uncovered. So you have a more, uh, a longer, a bigger pressure drop. And the advantage of this choke is that, is the, is that it dissipates a lot of energy by, you see the fluid goes through the side and enter through all the holes, okay? But when two holes are one in front of the other, you have two jets of fluid that are actually hitting each other and then going down. So you really are not causing erosion in many of the areas, but you are doing the heating and the, and the energy consumption when, when these beams are, you know, hitting, hitting each other. So it's a very clever design. Okay. So now we finish with all the valves, okay? Master valve, uh, wing valve, uh, choke, and downhole safety valve, just that you're aware of it. And the chokes, we have different types. We're going to make an exercise actually with this type of choke, but we really don't have a good model for the other type, okay, for this cage. You see the geometry is complicated, so we don't have really a, a good equation for these chokes. But we, you know, we will manage. You'll see how, what, what we're going to make. 
So let's take, let's talk about some other or one last uh, thing, and then we I discuss the exercise, and let's see if we have time for something else. But uh, one more thing is the need of pigging. And pigging is directly related to wax deposition. Okay, why why do I want to make pigging? Okay. Pigging basically consists on sending a plug, okay? And you will see the plug looks something like this. I have my pipe, okay, and I have something here in between, okay? And I push it with pressure or with fluid. So I pump fluid behind it, and it moves, this pig moves on one direction. Okay, and I have different different ways to you know different why I want I would like to do pigging in a pipe, but one of the things is to if I have some accumulation of something on the wall, okay, and that accumulation is going to grow and grow and be bigger and it's going to obstruct the pipe. It's actually going to clog the pipe. So I use it to to clean. Uh, so I will be to remove accumulation on the pipe wall and this accumulation you know we usually this is wax okay when you, these are C very heavy you know heavy uh, hydrocarbon fractions You know that the, the oil is made, you know, from chains, okay, from C1, C2, you know C1, what it is? Methane, okay, how it looks like? Okay, something like this, right? And you have all kind of chains. So when you go and start going more than C20 or C11, okay, if your oil has too much of these heavy alkanes, then if you lower the temperature, these heavy things will start, will have a tendency to come out as solids, okay? And that's what we call wax. And they have a tendency to deposit in the places where you have the coldest place in the pipe. And the coldest place is the, the wall, okay? So they will have a tendency to come out of liquid and then start depositing on the wall at a certain uh, temperature. So that's to remove wax. So I, that's what, how I make uh, pigging. Some other options are to remove Liquid accumulation, okay, for example, in gas lines, okay, let's assume that you have a, a gas pipeline, okay, and you have a lower point going up due to just the geometry of the terrain, and you have gas, but this gas has, usually is not pure gas, you have some small droplets of some liquid, okay, and with time, this liquid might become accumulated, accumulated, accumulated and it can actually block the pipe okay so what you do is you send a peak such that it can flush or actually push that liquid plug away okay out of this out of this system other things to do with the peak are inspection of pipeline integrity okay that can be corrosion to monitor the thickness, okay, etc. Okay, and another thing that can also be done, you can use it for for treatment, okay? Treatment of the inner pipe wall. Okay, and how do you do that? Basically you have the pipe and you have to you want to treat it with some you know, chemical, you want to improve the, the you want to do something that will protect against corrosion. So what you do is you have a peak, okay? Then you have another peak in the front, and in between you have this substance that you want to treat the pipe with, okay? So you push from the back, Usually this fluid that we use is just stabilized oil, oil that we have in the in the tanks, 
Okay, and here you have push in the front that you can have all kind of things in the front. Okay, you can have everything that was originally in the pipe. Okay, but now I go to the big question. Okay, so that's why we need pigging, and let me show you some how it looks like. You know, I always try to show you my drawing first and then how it looks like. Okay, that's how pigs look like. Yes, a piece in the center, like a bar or like a cylinder, and then you have these like uh, uh, cups, okay, on the side. Okay, and these cups, they are actually what they make the seal against the wall. So they have to be a bit bent, flexible. You have different types, yeah, cups, etc. So, and here we have a picture of a guy very happy that he, you know, managed to take out a big you know, plug of junk. That's a wax plug, okay? And imagine that's what it took from the whole pipe that was accumulated on the pipe. It can be 20 meters of, of this heavy component. And this is another type of pig, which is has a lot of instrumentation and needs to measure the thickness of the wall, corrosion, etc. So now we come to the part that, that concerns us. So if we say you have a pipe, okay? Let's say you have a well and you have a pipe in between and then you have, for example, an FPSO. Okay, here is your FPSO, and here, let's say that's your seabed, okay, and that's your, this, the surface of the water, okay, so how, if I want to send that peak, okay, where I I'm going to send it from, a place where I can insert it, right, in the system, where, what is the place where I have access, the most easiest as access in the system? here right in the fpso but that creates a problem if i send the p here then that's the old place where it will reach okay the wellhead but i want to be able everything for example if i'm picking for wax everything that comes in front of the pig i want to retrieve it so what is the only option you think huh i have to have two lines right such that for example I have my, if now I see it from the top, I have my well, okay? And I have put one line, and this is the FPSO. And then I put another line, and this well can produce, like I told you before, either to line one or to line two. Okay? So I send the pig from here, okay, I'm pushing with my pumps, with anything, I, put, I send it, and then I have to put a connection, okay, such that the pig will come again back to the FPSO. Clear? And that's the other function of having two lines, test, and also if I have, expect a lot of issues with wax, I need to inspect the pipe for some reason, I have to remove the liquid, then I have to have also two lines. Okay, and I have to have this one in between. But here comes a problem. If I produce well, let's say I want to produce, you know, there are two separators, okay? Also, separator A and separator B. Okay, if I want to produce well one to separator A, what happens here? This one should be open, right? And this one should be closed. But here also, this one, should, I should have something close here, because if I produce, this one is open, I can go either through here or I can go through here, right? So then I put a valve in between that is called the crossover valve, crossover valve, okay? That in normal operations is closed, but when I'm performing pigging, I open it and then circulate the pig. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> the way the, the I send the pig usually, let me see if I can draw the system, but usually, let me copy that. Here on the platform, on the FPSO, I put a, you know, my line normally goes to the separator here, okay? And then I have here like the peak launcher, okay? 
this is the, the peak launcher, this, this arrangement. So in normal operations, this valve is closed and this valve is open. Okay, so the wells can produce directly to this separator. When I want to perform pigging, I close this valve, I close this valve, I open this valve, okay, and I insert the pig from here in this chamber. Okay, then I have here another pipe where I connect it to my pump that is going to pump the fluid. Okay, so I put first no production, the well is closed, open this valve, put the pig inside in this chamber that you will see very soon. And then I close the chamber, open this valve, and start pushing the pig and open these valves. Okay? Yes? So let me see if I find that... Um, Ample to act to persons to use the ample. It as a launcher. Also. Okay. You see you have a pipe that might go to the separator. Okay. And here I have a valve. And here I have another valve and I have a container. Okay. Normally existing launchers do not require modifications to use the ample system. Also. Okay, and here I have the line that actually have the power fluid. So I put open here, put the pig inside, close it, and then I pressurize with this line. Either I can do it from the separator, maybe I have one high pressure source, or I can do it from some other place. And then that pig will be launched and will be sent through the line. Okay, and for the receiver, I have a similar arrangement. So let me see if I find that figure someplace here. Okay, that's the same that I explained. Um, no. I can I can find it later. I, I think I will put it later. But uh, you you got the idea. Okay, it's a piece of pipe that where I send the pig from there, and also it should have the same arrangement when I re when the pig comes back. Here also I have that it can go either to the separator or can go to another chamber here where I have my peak, okay, the peak receiver. Okay, that's the other purpose of having two lines. For example, in, in Brazil, they say offshore, every well I have to be able to test Okay, I want to be test, and the only method approved for testing is a test separator. There is no other method, no no chance. Okay, so in those cases, you have to have two lines. And in my view, that you are 2.5 kilometers water depth. These lines are very expensive and are going to cause a big pain for your project economically. But there is no other way. You have to have these two lines in place, okay, to be able to test. Some other one, okay, so that's the, 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 the home exercise you're going to have, okay? We have, so the, the home exercise, and that's part of your grade for this course. Okay. Let's say you have three wells, three satellite wells. Subsea wells. We have one common line, only one line going to the FPSO. But we also still want to measure how much each well is producing somehow. Okay. So someone told me, you know, remember to commingle all of them. You need a common structure called a manifold. Okay, where all of these come inside. Okay, and then I have that line. So I say, the manufacturer FMC says, please, you know, to all of you, design a manifold or write that. That's what we call like the um, PID, 
Okay, piping, instrumentation, diagram. Okay, what I showed you, the flow lines are where you're going to put every valve, such that if I have one multi-phase meter, it's a meter that magically can measure the rates without separating, okay, without separating. If I have one multi-phase meter in this manifold, what arrangement should I have to, you know, to inside the manifold? Okay, one multi-phase meter. inside the manifold so and your question is please provide a solution and the solution is it's a, a flow diagram okay to be able to test individually each will okay I have only one line here and I have only one line coming in but I have to do something to be able to pass each well well one well two and will three to that multi-phase meter and this multi-phase meter is something that is expensive okay they don't want to have three for each one of them because they could put for example here they could put the multi-phase meter but they don't want because they will cost, you know, at first it's costly, and then if I, you know, it gets damaged, I have to replace the three. So it's a big operation. So they want to have just one and in the manifold. When they replace it, and they can use it whenever they want. But you have to design this manifold such that, you know, you can do it. Okay, that's your, your homework. Okay, remember the same philosophy. We have to send the wells either to the manifold and separator, or we want to send directly to the separator. Okay, so we have to have two headers. If we have two headers, we have to have two sets of valves for each well, routing valves. Yes? Okay, so that's, that's uh, home exercise one. That here? Yes, piece of cake? Okay. Yes, uh, so <clears throat> I think was something missing here that we forgot to add. No. Okay, so now let's go to, to what, you know, what, to the second part of the lecture. that we say flow equilibrium, okay? And that's the generic term that, you know, my colleagues and myself use in that NTNU, flow equilibrium. But, you know, it's also related to some other terms that you use, nodal analysis. And you have to be careful, these, these are not very clear what you're doing, and also they are trademark terms, okay? Uh, so if you use nodal analysis with capital, like exactly how I wrote here, you have to pay Slumberger because they own the name, okay? If it appears on the name. You have also inflow, outflow, balance, all kind of names, okay? But we are going to call it flow equilibrium. And that's the basis for like the rest of the things we're going to make, you know, in these two weeks. Okay, and it's, and it's very general. So let's make, start first with an example. Okay. Okay, we have a pipe. And we have, let's say, a horizontal pipe. And this pipe, let's say it has either gas or it has liquid, it doesn't have multi-phase, okay? It has only one phase. And we have a point that we are going to call in, and we're going to have a point that we're going to call out, and we have a rate through it, Q. Okay? We have three ways 
that we can perform calculations on this pipe. One of them, number one, we say fix P in somehow I'm fixing that pressure. I'm using a control or I'm using something to fix P1. Then change Q and obtain a Q and obtain P out. Okay. I leave the pressure at the inlet constant and then I have the rate and I calculate the P, right? I have, I then, then I use another rate and I calculate the P and so forth. So let's make a plot of that variation of P out versus Q, okay? With P in constant. How is that graph going to look like? When I have no rate, what pressure should I get at the out? P, louder with confidence. No, no, the P out that I'm measuring here. I have a P, a pressure gauge, and a pressure gauge. If I have no rate, what pressure should I measure in P out? Huh? No, the same as P in, right? Because I have no flow. So, the, and there is no elevation in the horizontal pipe, right? So here I have, when Q is equal to zero, I have P in, okay? Now what happens if I start increasing the rate? Now let's say I have one liter per minute going through that pipe. How should be the pressure? Huh? It should be decreasing, okay? So let's put P in a bit higher. Okay, P in, let's put it here. Okay, so you're saying that the next point should be someplace here. Okay? Why? Because the pressure out is going to be the pressure in plus friction, delta P due to friction. Right? And this delta P is a function of rate. Yes? So as I increase the rate, this delta P will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? So the curve looks something like that. Yes? All of you agree? See it very clearly? That's very critical for what we're going to do next. Okay? Am I going to baptize? You know, everyone wants to give names to everything. So I'm also going to baptize. So I say is this is the available pressure. Uh, at pipe outlet calculated co-current from the inlet. Okay, it's a very long name, but it really explains everything that we need, okay? is the available pressure that I have after I have performed calculations from the inlet of the pipe, I progress along with the flow all the way to the discharge. Okay? A long name, but that's exactly what it is. All of you agree? It's going to look like that? Yes? So now let's go for mode 2. Okay, mode 2 is I fix P out. Okay? Let's say I'm producing against a separator. And change Q and obtain P in. Okay? I have Q, I have P in, okay? And this is P out equal P, okay? So how is that curve going to look like? For no rate, what should happen? If I'm fixing this pressure somehow, no rate, horizontal pipe, P in should be equal to P out, right? Or P separator, exactly the same. Now it becomes tricky. If I increase the rate, what should happen? P in. Okay. Let's, let's make it here. P in equal to P out, which is constant, plus delta P. Is it? Okay. 
Yeah, it's exactly the same, right? The, the same equation should be, well, here we made a mistake, okay? Here it should be minus, if delta p is, right? Yes, now it makes sense. If delta p, let's make to be sure, we put an absolute here. Let's make an absolute. Okay? So that means that p will increase when the rate is increasing. Okay, because the friction losses will be higher and higher, so that's how the curve looks like. Yes, going up. All of you agree? Yes. Yes? Okay. You know, I'm taking it slow, but... Uh, okay, so this is the required pressure. I baptize a required pressure at a pipe inlet calculated countercurrent from pipe outlet. Okay, a long name, but that's exactly what it is. That's the pressure that I require. If I want to flow against this separator pressure with this rate, Q, I need exactly that pressure at the inlet of the pipe. And that pressure I calculate just by coming, starting from this point with the rate and going and calculating the delta P. Yes? No problem. Clear so far. And there is one third way that we can perform calculations that we're not going to talk about it too much is give P1, P in, and P out, and calculate Q. Right? I can also do that. Yes? But that we're not going to use too much. But if I give the two pressures, I can calculate the rate. Okay. Now let's try to extrapolate this, you know, thinking you say is very trivial. You know, we saw this in maybe primary school or kindergarten. I know this since I was born. So why, you know, why the big fuss? So the thing is that we can use the same logic to analyze production systems, okay, to analyze complex systems of wells, networks, what we just covered just now, okay? And let's make a, a very simple example. So let's have a well again. Remember, you have to draw it when you are in the middle of the night. It's a well that has no choke, okay? And it's very close to a separator. Okay? And here I have a system where I have two bounds, okay? Two very clear bounds. I have the separator and I have the reservoir and the flow is going from here to here. So I'm going to choose a point, any point in the system. Arbitrarily, I choose, you know, you, depending on the application, you select where to put it. But I will say exactly here, okay? At the bottom hole, what we call PWS. And I'm going to do the same thing that we have done before and I'm going to calculate the available pressure at this point calculated from the two boundaries, okay, from the two bounds. And you will see I will have the first calculation uh, method and the second calculation method. So now let's say, okay, let's plot here, make a plot PWF, that's what I want to compute, versus Q, okay? And I want to calculate first the available pressure curve. Remember, the available is co-current with the flow. The flow goes from reservoir to bottom hole, right? Okay, so I'm going to move from PR to bottom hole. If rate is equal to zero, what pressure do I have? Reservoir pressure, right? Reservoir pressure. Now, when I start increasing the rate, what do I get? The pressure goes down or up? Down, okay? Just what uh, Professor Alex was telling you, you know, last week. We get, how do we call this curve? Huh? IPR, okay? The inflow performance relationship. 
Yes, and that we did just by calculating from here to here, taking into account the pressure drop. Remember, the, the IPR tells you what is the pressure drop that you have in the reservoir. So now let's do the same, but going from the other bound. Okay, what is the other bound? The separator. Okay, so if rate is equal to zero, what is the pressure that I have, the bottom hole pressure? Rate is zero. So I have separator pressure will be very similar to wellhead pressure. Right? Yes. And then I have the hydrostatic column because there is no flow, but I have a hydrostatic column to reach to the bottom hole. Okay? So here we have P separator plus the hydrostatic column. Okay? Now let's call it, you know, if we call this delta H, this will be know something trivial for you delta h rho g right yes that will be the point no flow when i start flowing okay when i start how you know what how the pressure that i need to flow against this separator pressure behaves will i need more or less than the than for no flow more okay I need, and that makes sense. I need more pressure here to be able to flow against separator because now I don't only have this component, but I have also the friction through the tubing. Okay? So that goes like that. Okay? And you can argue, okay, one is, okay, so cur curve number one, I see that pressure from here. Okay? And curve number two, I see that pressure from here. That's my curve number two. But really, is the point different? I'm asking you. The point that I'm visualizing, is it different? You see that the two pressures, you know, they are different. Is it, the, it is the same point, okay? No matter how you look at it. If you look at it from here, you look at it from here, it should be the same point. It should be the same pressure. And there is only one point where that happens. Where is it? The intersection. Okay? Exactly here. That means if this system is operating the way it is here, this is the equilibrium rate. That's the only unique rate that the system will be producing. All of you agree? Yes? Because it's the only place where the available meets the required. They are exactly the same. Okay, so that's the equilibrium rate. Okay, now I'm going to test you to see if you are, you know, you are, you understood. So now let's make the same plot. I told you, I can choose any point in the system. I'm going to choose the wellhead. Okay, I'm going to plot again, but now the wellhead. PWH, seen from both sides. So now let's go the available pressure at the wellhead. Okay, how that curve looks like? When I have no flow, what pressure do I have here? PR minus rho H G. Okay, so I have that point, for example, here. Is it? Plus or minus? I ask you, plus or minus? I think we have a mistake. Minus, okay? Well, I, I, I said maybe, yeah. And what happens when I start increasing the rate? Start to go down, okay? The available pressure curve goes down. And that's because I have then the friction, okay? Delta P of the friction. Yes? Everybody sees how, why is that? And you have to think always intuitively. The available always should look like that. Okay? Descendant, monotonic, uh, the, the, you know, downwards. Now, I want to calculate that pressure from the separator, okay? To make the intersection. But this piece of pipe really is very, very, very short. Okay? So really, practically, these two pressures are the same. So what does it mean? How is the required pressure?
constant, right? If this pipe was, for example, I have the pipeline that I showed you before going to a platform, 10 kilometers, then it will look like that. But in this case, they are exactly, they are very close, exactly on the same point. So this one is just constant, P separator. Okay, and this is the equilibrium point that I have, the intersection between these two. Now I ask you, how is the rate Q equilibrium 2 versus Q equilibrium 1? Should they be the same? Should they be different? Different, the same? The same. If we put that well to produce, let's say, we put certain separator pressure, we open choke, we put it to produce. Do you think it will be able to produce two rates or it will produce one rate? What does the logic tell you? It should produce one rate, right? Unique rate. So that means if I did that calculation looking from in one point or in the other point, the rate should be the same because the result to be, you know, to be logical, to be reproducible, then it should give me the same result no matter where I did. If I do it here, if I do it here, if I do it here, any point, it should give me the same. Okay? The only thing is what the curve contains. This curve contains, this curve I call TPR, okay? that's the tubing performance relationship and that only contains the pressure drop in the tubing okay and this one contains the pressure drop in the formation now this one how do we call it using the same nomenclature that we had before okay we call it wellhead performance relationship Okay, go ahead. Okay, WPR. Yeah, and this one we, we don't call it just separator pressure. Okay, and this one inc includes IPR plus TPR. Okay, formation plus tubing. So as the system becomes more complex, you have to see what are you including in your, where do you put the point, and that defines what your available curve is including and what your required curve is including. Yes? Okay, I... Okay, you, you, now you have to... No, that's just an act of faith that I'm going to tell you, you have to accept it. What rate is here, okay? What rate do I have here? In the case before, I was talking about a pipe with liquid, okay? Or, for example, with gas. This Q, you imagine, okay, it's the, the, you know, the rate, just the volumetric rate, okay? The units of that will be cubic meter per hour, per second, etc. the unit that you decide. But when you go to this complicated system, what happens here? The pressure is changing dramatically all along the system. Okay, all along the... So that means that the Q local, okay, the Q in cubic meter per day is changing very much across the system. So if I make the curve, it will be a bit inconvenient. So what we are going to use is the Q at standard conditions for the curve. And the curve will have exactly the same shape. Okay, Q as standard condition. That means a standard cubic meter per day. We choose one reference condition, which is T standard condition, 15.56 degrees Celsius or 60 Fahrenheit. And P, 1.01325 bar, okay, or uh, 14.67. 5.7. Seven. PSI, okay, and that's where I report the rate. Okay, and you have to believe me that this curve looks the same when you use the standard conditions. Okay, not when you use local, but that's how the curve looks like if you use standard conditions rate. 
that like you know is proportional Q standard condition is somehow proportional to the mass flow that is circulating through the system yes okay so yeah, it looks like we're going to finish I think you need some time to process you know to do the homework also if you have some questions but let's, you know, I want to make one more. Okay, so that's how the curve looks like, the tubing for single phase. And we're going to look. So the whole motivation for this week is to look, you already uh, covered with Professor Alex how this curve is calculated, okay? How do we approximate? Do we get it from tests? How do we estimate if we have a radial reservoir, if we have a horizontal reservoir? You have different ways to estimate this curve. Now, what these two weeks are about, you know, and it's really two weeks, you say, oh, it's a lot of time, but not really, is to see, to find out how this curve looks like and how do we estimate that curve? Because if we have these two, then we can find how the system can operate. Okay, and you will see now why it's uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, you know why do we want to so it doesn't matter the system doesn't matter how complicated it is if it has three phases if it's a network if you have multiple wells if you have subsea wells template wells etc all of them can be analyzed using this you know using this uh, this nodal analysis so I'm going to ask you before before we close. What if, you know, for this system, what if I want to produce a rate less than the equilibrium rate? Okay. What if I want to produce, for some reason, let's say, you know, if I start producing too high rate, I will get, you know, sand production. Sand will start to come loose due to the high speed, will start to come loose from the formation. What happens if I want to restrict that, that rate, if I want to reduce it? What do I have to, to do? <coughs> okay, remember all the valves in this system, they are fixed except one. The choke, okay? It's the only valve that we can change. What is the problem with my drawing? It doesn't have a choke. So you tell me, it's very simple, I put the choke. But how? So where, if I put the choke, how this changes? Where I'm going to put the choke? Okay, so let me copy this system again. You have to do some more work than I have. Okay, I'm going to put the choke, I make an opening here, okay? And I'm going to put the choke exactly in this place okay i'm going to put it here in this vacuum that i have yes and how do i calculate what delta p of choke do i have to put there okay i can i have to choose okay remember for flow equilibrium i have first to do one thing to choose the point where where i'm going to run my analysis if i run it here Okay, then how will that change my analysis? I have to make from reservoir pressure to here. That remains the same, the same IPR, right? But when I do from here to here, I have to include the choke. Okay, I have to find an equation to include the choke. And I'm not exactly sure how that will look like. Okay, but what I suggest, I say, let's do something smarter. Let's put the equilibrium point here. Okay. And then I calculate available pressure, upstream the choke, exactly here. And then I calculate required downstream the choke, P upstream and P downstream. Okay. Do you agree? Yes, I calculate from reservoir all the way upstream to the choke, from separator all the way downstream to the choke. Okay, and that's exactly the same graph I have here. Right? But now I have an element that can bridge... This element I can regulate, and this can give me any delta P I want. So if I want, let me just copy that again. If I want this rate, 
this is the choke I have to put something that breaches that difference. The available cannot be greater than the required, otherwise I have to increase the rate. Also the required cannot be bigger than the available, I have to reduce the rate, right? So I have to find something that breaches, and this is the delta P of the choke. And you see by doing that, I really don't need, like in this case, you know, doing the equilibrium here, I don't really need a choke model, okay? I just need to say, I need a choke that will give me this delta P to get the rate that I want. Okay? That clear? Questions? No questions? Okay. So we close the session here. I will try to see if the video was produced properly. And if you have any questions about the exercise, we can take them just at the end. Okay? Uh, maybe now in this in these minutes. If not, you know, you are you refresh and you think about it and you try to come up with a solution. Okay, thank you for today. See you tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.